Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Lenten devotion. Our theme is God on trial. Yes, God, Jesus Christ, was on trial before Pontius Pilate, offering him truth, and that truth is offered to us in his word today. We'll begin as grades 6 to 8 sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. If you'd like to follow along with those words, they're printed for you on page 2. Please rise. We confess our sins and receive that wonderful news of Christ's forgiveness. In the name of our God, to whom all hearts are open and from whom no secrets are hidden. Amen. I confess that I am by nature sinful. I am guilty of many sins. I am distressed by the sins that trouble me. For all this I am sorry. I pray for forgiveness. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Jesus says to his people, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe. By the authority of Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated as we sing a song version of Psalm 1. We pray, Lord God, support us all the years of our lives, that we may follow your gracious will, 
both in good times and bad, that our lives may be an unending testimony to your love and faithfulness through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue with the reading of our Savior's last days compiled from the four Gospels. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people and said to them, You brought me this man who was one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither is Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore I will punish him and then release him. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all shouted, Crucify him! Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! We sing hymn 428, O Sacred Head Now Wounded.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and the way, the truth, and the life, our Savior Jesus Christ. The sermon is based on John chapter 18, verses 33 to 40. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Bless us as we sit at your feet today and learn what it means to trust in you alone as the only truth. Amen. Direct your eyes to the screen. There's an interesting trick to these cards here. There's a line on the, the reference card on the left that is the same length as one of the three lines on the comparison card to the right. Now it looks pretty simple, but here's the test. Can you see which line is equal to the, the one line? Is it line A, line B, or line C? How certain are you of your answer? I imagine most of you probably find this relatively easy, but it's not uncommon to get mixed up. The answer is line B. These cards were part of a psychology experiment from the 1950s called the Ash Conformity Experiment. In this experiment, eight students sat in a line to answer questions. They were to answer out loud, but the first seven of those students were actually paid actors who were told how to respond. The one student at the end was the subject being tested. Now, at first, they all answered correctly or based on what they thought, but on certain questions, the seven paid actors were told to answer incorrectly. That person at the end of a the line then heard seven people give the incorrect answer, and the test was to see if they would conform to the group or if they would give the answer they thought was correct. Do you know how many people in this test conformed to the false answers of the group? 75% of subjects. Now only a small fraction of those people actually conformed on every single question, but overall 75% of people went with the group's false answer at least one or more times. How do you think you would do on a test like this? <laughs> in answers afterwards, the, the participants said, some of them said, well, I genuinely believed that I wasn't seeing clearly. Others thought that they would be silly to assume that they were right and everyone else was wrong. One participant even said that he knew the answers were wrong, but he didn't want to stick out. And so he conformed to the group, he gave the wrong answer, not to draw attention to himself. How would you do? You hear seven wrong answers in front of you. Would you stick to the truth? Well, think back to that comparison I first showed you. I apologize for lying to you, but the real answer was actually line C. Did you doubt your answer? Did you try to rationalize it away? Well, pastor said so, I must be wrong, right? I must not be seeing clearly. It's the screens. My point is that even when we're pretty objectively certain about something, we can still be susceptible to falsehood. We can so easily sometimes be conformed away from the truth. Now, misjudging a few lines on a card is one thing, but being led to doubt the truth of God's word, the truth of who Jesus is, is something much more serious. And that's exactly what happened when the Son of God stood on trial before a Roman governor some 2,000 years ago. The Roman governor's name was Pontius Pilate. He was the Roman governor of the region of Judea. And his tenure ran, we think, from about 10 years, 26 to 36 A.D., although some say his duties started back in 19 A.D. But with either set of dates, to hold such power in an 
over this very volatile region for an extended period of time meant that Pilate was no slouch. He was a shrewd ruler. And during his time, there had been many uprisings. He had stifled rebellions. He had maintained a modicum of peace. And he had seen many self-proclaimed saviors and kings come and go. It's interesting to think of what Pilate might have thought about Jesus. He may have heard about him. He was very popular. He had great crowds following of him. He might have heard of his miracles and signs like Herod did. He probably certainly had heard about his triumphal entry into Jerusalem where thousands of people stripped palm branches completely free and shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. A new king? That would have got his attention. Remember the Pharisees said, stop this. <laughs> you need to tell your disciples to stop yelling. They were concerned about the Romans coming and snuffing out this rebellion. In general, the, the Passover was always a difficult time for Pilate. The city was bloated with pilgrims from all over. Some say the, the city could swell to 10 times its normal size during the Passover festival. And it was a festival that celebrated the Jews' liberation from a foreign oppressor in the Exodus. In other words, with the Romans now as the oppressor, tensions were naturally high. And so when the Jewish leaders dragged this, this poor beaten man in front of Pilate and says that this is a man claiming to be king of the Jews, and they even said, he proclaims himself a king, Pilate wants to handle this carefully and quickly. Let's look at this conversation. He starts out with the question, are you the king of the Jews? Pilate wants to know if Jesus is a threat. A simple yes or no would do, but, but Jesus would like to have a little bit different conversation. He says, is that your own idea, or did others talk to you about me? Jesus probably would like to talk about what it means that he is a king apart from the, the baggage that Pilate had heard from the Jewish leaders. But Pilate really doesn't seem too interested in understanding Jesus. He just wants to get the facts straight. He says, am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed over to me. What is it you have done? And now notice how, how cautious Jesus is with his answer. He wants Pilate and anyone who hears, like us today, to understand what he, he's saying. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus first lets Pilate know, I'm not leading a rebellion here. I'm not going to stir up the crowds to, to fight and storm the praetorium. My kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. I'm a different kind of king. Unfortunately, again, Pilate just wants to stay on, stay on track. He says, ah, oh, you are a king then. We're getting somewhere now. But Jesus doesn't go down that route. He simply says, you say that I am a king. In other words, I'm not the type of king you're thinking of. He says, in fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus says, you care about getting to the truth? So do I. That's why I came to this world. And with that, Pilate simply retorts, what is truth? And he goes back out to speak with the chief priests and the leaders of the people. Considering Pilate's background, we think as a, as a military man, his time in politics, I doubt that he's asking about some abstract philosophical question about the nature of truth. I can almost hear the disgust or dismissiveness in this question. What is truth? Right? It's not really a question, is it? It's more of a statement. Is there really anything that we can say is true? Jesus, I don't know what you're talking about. Right? 
the Jewish chief priests and leaders are badgering him, the supposed religious truth tellers. They want this man to die. They, they haul him in here, and, and Pilate sees this poor, bedraggled Jewish teacher who seems harmless enough, and yet he's making these grandiose statements like, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. I have come into this world to testify to the truth. Pilate's been around the block, right? He's seen truth bandied about by different parties or twisted by ruthless men to get what they want. It's understandable that a man in his position would doubt the reality of truth, isn't it? In some ways, we can relate to Pilate very well when he says, what is truth? We live in a confusing world too, don't we? Facts are spun by different people to support a claim, to support a cause, or to get you to vote for someone. What is truth, we might say, when we look at the world? Everyone has their own experts, their own facts, their own undeniable truth. Even the experts, the scientists, maybe your doctors, they can't agree on what's the best path forward. We've probably asked that question a few times ourselves, right? What is truth? How can I know this is true? And sadly, when so many things are uncertain in this world, when people are, are uncertain, that affects our faith too sometimes, doesn't it? We wonder, can I really trust God's word? Is Jesus really true? Is the Bible really true in what it says? Sometimes it feels like we're in a giant conformity experiment with Professor Ash, right? And there are voices yelling at us, right? Saying that, that the Bible is not true, that there's all sorts of things about Jesus that are not true, and it's tempting sometimes to conform. Now, we, we might not deny Jesus, but we might take a step back in proclaiming the truth we might not take a stand when Jesus calls us to. We might sometimes be led to feel foolish or ashamed for believing the truth of Jesus. Pontius Pilate serves as a solemn warning for us. In the end, because he doubted the truth of Jesus, he conformed to the demands of people. Because they cried for crucifixion, Pilate flogged an innocent man, and Jesus was crucified under his authority. Pontius Pilate may wash his hands, but they remain eternally crimson with the blood of Christ. During Lent and Holy Week, we think about the physical suffering of Jesus a lot. The beating, the, the crown of thorns, the scourging, and of course, the cross. But we don't perhaps consider always the emotional pain, the deep sadness that he endured. Jesus said, I came into this world to testify to the truth. Now think about that. No one understood the truth about people and about God better than Jesus. No one better understood the depravity and the sinfulness of humanity than Jesus Christ. And no one better understood the loving heart of God which wanted to save every single one of those people. It is Jesus who knew the truth that if anyone would trust in him, they could come to the Father and be forgiven. And Jesus wanted that for everyone he met. He wanted that for the crowds in Galilee. He wanted them to know that he would give them more than just physical bread. He wanted that woman at the well in Samaria to know that he brought living water. He wanted Pilate to know what a true king looks like. He even wanted those Pharisees and chief priests to come to the knowledge of the truth and receive mercy. Jesus, looking over the city of Jerusalem, you can hear the sadness in his voice. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you together as a hen gathers its chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Or when Jesus approaches Jerusalem, he's on that donkey, people are, are cheering, crowds are shouting his praise as he enters 
Jerusalem, but before the city gates, Luke tells us that Jesus began to weep. Jesus begins to cry and he says, if you, even you, had only known what would have brought you peace this day, but your eyes were closed because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus came to testify to the truth, the truth of God's saving love, and it broke his heart that people didn't believe him, both then and today. You see, the, the truth, <laughs> ultimate truth is not a fact, it's not a formula, it's not a theory, it's not an expert's decision. According to God, truth is a person. Truth is Jesus Christ. The Word made flesh, God made man, the only source of our salvation. In this life, there are so many things we can't be sure of, but we know this. Jesus was born into the world to testify to the truth of his own love, to reveal the heart of God for sinners. And how do we know this is the truth? Well, look at what Jesus did. Look at how he willingly bowed his head to scorn and shame for you. Watch as he allowed them to whip and spit on him and mock him for you. Watch as they press that crown of thorns into his skull and watch as he hangs upon the cross in your place. It's undeniable. The truth of God's love for you is complete. The truth of God's forgiveness of your sins is undeniable. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In our times, when truth seems to be whatever anybody wants it to be, isn't there such a comfort, a deep comfort in knowing that we have something true, that we have a solid foundation to stand on. I think everywhere outside of the Bible now has sort of become uncertain for me. <laughs> I'm too worried about being manipulated or conformed by different groups. I'm even concerned about simply reading my own bias into everything. But here in, in God's word, in the words of Jesus Christ, we are on the side of truth. What we have in the scriptures is reliable for now and for eternity. I'll end with what Jesus said in John 8. To those who believed in him, he said, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Amen. Now the peace of God which surpasses all of our understanding may it guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. After I offer some special prayers, we'll join in our responsive prayer. Our Father, by your mercy and might, the world turns safely into darkness and returns again to light. We place into your hands our unfinished tasks, our unsolved problems, and our unfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. To your great love and protection, we commit each other and all those we love knowing that you alone are our sure defender. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May the God of hope fill you with peace and joy as you trust in him. Please be seated for our closing hymn, The Power of the Cross. <laughs> 